Boy, can I help you? Listen up. I'm bringing you the best content to ever exist in the door-to-door industry from sales, leadership, recruiting, and personal development. Well, why would I need that? Because never before have we been able to collaborate with the top experts in their industries, sharing their secrets and techniques on what makes them the best. Wait, who, who are you? I'm your host, Sam Taggart, creator of the DDD Experts and DDD Con. Is there a place we can sit down? Well, come on in. Register today for D2D Con, January 10th through 12th. Learn from over 40 amazing speakers, including the real wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort. Come as a team, learn as a team, leave as a tribe. All right, everybody, this is Sam Taggart, and I am here with Christian Calabuso from New Jersey, all the way on live Facebook and on be live and whatever the stuff we're streaming, SoundCloud, iTunes. I don't know what this is on. <laughs> anyway, so we got we got Kristen in the house. He is a not he doesn't even do door to door. He's just a college baseball kind of guru. No, I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> no, he is the senior vice president of Trinity Solar, which is the largest solar company in the East Coast. If you sold solar on the East Coast, you kind of like fetch. Trinity is in my neighborhood and <laughs> you'll know who they are. And uh, no, so he has managed, you know, what, upwards of 600 people plus at this point? Yeah, we have 600 yeah, sales reps in the field, uh, you know, uh, over 1,700 employees as a company. So a yeah, pretty, pretty big space for us to uh, go play in. Yeah. And I think uh, when you first got, I mean, when you first got to Trinity, how many guys were there? Oh goodness! I believe I was employed just over a thousand, and maybe just uh, two years before that, let's say three years before that, we had maybe uh, two hundred employees. So the the growth has been astronomical over the years. So it's just been fun to watch. So I know uh, th- I know hundreds of solar companies that are like, oh, we'd love to uh, have more than five people. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, so I think if that's you and you're listening to this and you're like, oh, I've, I've got a team of, you know, six or seven setters. It's like, well, Christian's got a team of like, I don't know, hundreds of, set, you know what I mean? Like, so I think, uh, I think this would be one you probably want to listen to because we're going to be talking about, you know, how to structure things, the difference in working with leaders that have different backgrounds and merging things together, different setter and closer programs and kind of how to manage those. And so, you know, I think if, you know, even in the roofing space, you know, I consult a lot of roofers and it's a similar sale where, you you know, it's a slower process. You've got to, you know, kind of baby the baby, the customer through install. So this would be a really powerful one for roofing owners, roofing leaders. Look, and then also people just looking to be better leaders. I think, you know, in any industry, like, you know, stepping their game up and working with different dynamics and whatnot. So this is kind of your podcast. If this is you. And uh, yeah, let's dive into it. So tell me, I guess my favorite question is like, who recruited you and how'd they recruit you? And were you easy, were you hard? Tell me about that. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. a good question. Uh, so w- when I was at Protection One, um, one of my guys named Brandon Furugirad was, was actually one of my reps, uh, wanted to get into solar for the really the past two seasons that we were there. And I talked him out of it each time. Uh, he ended up coming over to Trinity and, um, you know, as I was getting out of protection one solely because ADT, uh, you know, acquired P1, uh, it forced me to look elsewhere. Uh, so with that, you know, um, I started, I went to Vivint, checked out Vivint Inc., went out to Legacy, checked out Legacy. Um, and then uh, my guy, Brandon, had uh, the VP at the time, Josh Williams, uh, reach out to me just for a recruiting trip. So decided to come out for a steak dinner, uh, fell in love with the company, you know, came on, um, yeah, so the guy who recruited me was uh, Josh Williams at the time, who now uh, runs. Love Josh, yeah, amazing yeah. dude. We need to get we need to get him on his podcast. Yeah. Um, okay, so then, so you said okay. Where I guess so when you first started in door door sales, what was it easy? Was it hard? Like, did you just pick it up right away? Did you like suck at the beginning? Tell me kind of your first day. What did that look like? Really good question. So I, I drive to Indiana, right? And this is after I quit my job. I drive out there. I'm super stoked. Had a couple buddies who were out there. Um, and, and, I, and I wasn't really connecting the dots on what door to door really was. So I go out there. I, I watch him sell literally his first door. Um, his name was Ryan Gibbs. Goes out there, crushes it. And I say, hey, I think I got this. I, I kind of think I got it on my own. If I get a sell, can I just call you? Because uh, look, I think I know how to talk to people, right? 
So I end up going, I go, I, he drops me off in this hood, literally after the first sale I see him do, I can't be there for longer than 40 minutes in area. I just got to Indiana. Um, drops me off in this hood. I knock my first door. Um, I don't get it. I get my pitch off. It was pretty easy to do. Um, my second door, I get the sale. I get in, I get inside. Um, I sell the, I sell the alarm and I didn't know what a takeover was. So my entire first year of alarms, I just did freshies. Um, so I get in, I, I get to the back door. I start talking about the, you know, the, the potential threats that could come back through the back door as, as I, as I was taught to do literally on the first sale that I saw, uh, give my manager a call. I say, Hey dude, um, I had this one locked up. Can you please come help me do the paperwork? Um, ends up driving over, uh, helps me get the sale. I go to my next door. I also get that door. Um, so literally on my first day, I knocked out my first out of my three doors. I picked up two sales, uh, and probably my first year through alarms, I thought I was just lucky. You know, I, I truly felt that every single person I got to, I was like, goodness, how the heck did I connect to that customer so well? You know, but I come to the philosophy of um, luck for me. Um, I've read this quote many places. Uh, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So I found that, you know, was, was door to door and was selling the alarm hard. Um, if you look at it like selling the alarm, yes, it was hard. Um, but I looked at it as I was just having really good conversations and making a friend with people on the doors. Uh, so I kind of uh, uh, yes. uh, detached sales and uh, really what I was doing, if that makes sense. Had you, had you done any sales before that? Um, super funny question. Uh, in, in high school, I actually sold door to door newspaper. Uh, my freshman year. Yeah, dude, I sold ice. <laughs> Drop me I off. Love- <laughs> yeah, dude, I had a little, uh, little sling carrying newspapers. <laughs> Knocking door to door, I had to be 14 years old or 15 years old, something like that, um, selling full packages for freaking newspaper. So yeah, I've I've done a couple of sales jobs before. That's, That's awesome. awesome. Oh, oh shoot, shoot. do you? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Can you see me? Yeah. yeah can, can you hear me? Is it like an echo in my ear? Um, a, a tad, a tad. Okay. It's just, it's just in my ear. That's cool. Okay. So, question. When you f- first started, what advice would you give to these brand new guys? Obviously, it sounds like you kind of went in cocky. You're like, I got this. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could do this. Um, what it, What advice would you give those kind of new guys? Sure. It, it, it's funny because I would actually go with the exact opposite approach of what I went with. You know, I found that I find that, you know, I like to go after uh, cowboys and athletes, right? Athletes just don't know how to lose. And cowboys are just hard workers, which would be construction workers. Um, I find that athletes who are used to winning every time, um, let's say like a football player who you're not used to making mistakes, it's a lot more challenging to do this job because you're used to the consistent winning. Whereas I play baseball, dude, to to perform three out of 10 times, that's a win for me. So to say I was used to losing, um, I think that's the best way I, I, I could put it. So really going into going into doors right at first is to have realistic expectations. You're not going to go out there. You're not going to get your first door. You're probably not going to get your second door. In fact, you're probably not going to get your first hundred doors. Uh, play the mm-hmm. lottery, right? Learn from the top leaders that are out there and understand that it's, there's a learning curve and there's really no definitive learning curve, whether it's one day, one week, or three months. Um, go out there, put the hard work in, learn from the leaders who are around you, uh, and don't set these high lofty goals that want, you don't even know what the sector is like. Get out there, understand the job, connect with people and look for the small wins versus the big ones. You know, you can have a positive conversation and that's a win. I love that because, you know, you kind of said something that was it stood out to me when you were like, hey, when I first started, I didn't really I didn't really get what door to door was. And then you just said, you know, you got to learn from the best and go learn from your leaders and go be humble and be, be hungry. And it kind of brings me to like you know, you're, you're one of the keynote speakers at door to door con. I know you're pretty skeptical about the whole event last year. Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of people were, but now knowing kind of what it is and it is a neutral playing ground where it's not to recruit and it's where people can really come and, 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 and help expose their people to really what door to door is. I mean, it's like, what a better place to like show the world. It's like, this is what we are as a tribe. Take some pride and take the job serious Sure. And it's like, you can literally change the rest of your life, your destiny, your legacy you leave because like of this job. But I think most people that do it, they're like, well, I'll just do this till I can get a real job. I'll just do this. Till, you know what I mean? Like 
oh, it's just a sales thing. You know, those come and go. But it's like you've obviously taken this as a career. And I saw you just bought, bought or built a house. Yeah, I bought, a, bought a house. Last, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a fairly, a fairly nice one in New Jersey, and you know what I mean. It's like people know Christian. It's like he's living large. I mean, and yes, it's off of door to door sales money. Like congratulations, you know what I mean. It's like, and it's and and I think a lot of people they they fail to really grasp um, this whole industry, and you know what I mean. And it, it was interesting that you said. I just picked up on this. Like you're like I didn't really understand like what I was getting into. You know what I mean. Yeah, well, it's, uh, I was having this conversation with our, our VP of lead generation, Chris Gardner, the other day, and he said that, you know, the, we, we came to the uh, uh, conclusion of, you know, the problem with door to door is that people think it's just door to door. Uh, it's not. It's more than door to door. You're creating a lifestyle that you can have, let's say, unlimited income, unlimited impact. And ultimately, you can really do door to door with any business that you're going into. So, uh, you know, it, it goes along with what I said. I didn't really know what I was getting into, and I'm I'm so happy that you know you have door to door con. You're you're getting out there in the public of what is door to door, and it's not seen as this low level sales entry level position. Uh, forget that. You're you're going to meet some of the best, biggest, and baddest leaders that you've ever met in your entire life that come from the door to door sector. So, uh, very very excited to get to door to door con. As you said last year, I was a tad bit skeptical of it solely because you know I, I thought it would be a recruiting frenzy. And you've proven uh, with your consistency, with your podcast, um, again with the results of last year. I'm just excited to be around industry leaders to learn from them to come back to my company uh, and help us develop to be to, to be bigger and better. That's that's awesome, man. What are you what are you mo- what are you most excited to share? You know, guys, those that are listening, Kristen is a workshop, you know, host. He's literally got a he's got on the stage and he's going to drop some nuggets. But I guess like what are you what are you excited to kind of bring to the table to that? Like, where do you what are you fired up about that? Yeah, man, you, you know, it's very similar to, to like uh, what your initiative is. Well, right. Bringing integrity and bringing the growth, the true growth back to this market and really showing uh, you know, really showing the 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 uh, I can't think of the word. Let's say the the beauty of door to door, right? And especially while I'm here mm-hmm. at Tri- while I'm here at Trinity, you know, you asked me to speak on uh, motivating top teams, and it's not easy to motivate a top team month after month after month, right? It's easy to go do it, in my opinion, for four months of the summer, but how do you go do it twelve months out of the year? How do you yeah, get, when it's just yeah, it's just the same stuff every day. You know? how, do, how do you get them amped up when it's Christmas time? When it's we, I live in New Jersey. It's there's snow on the ground. There's no end in sight when it's January and summer's not for five months from now, right? I walked outside this morning. It's forty degrees outside. So how do we continue to motivate yeah. our, our our reps and our employees to go continue to perform at top levels because? You know, as we know, carrots and sticks don't necessarily work all the time. So how do we make this be a career, uh, not just a job that we come into uh, land somewhere else? So really, uh, you know, narrowing down what I'm excited to speak about this career that we do have in door to door. I love it. I love it. Well, let's dive into let's dive into some of these nuggets. So to me, can I ask you like really personal questions? So you sold, you know, a megawatt in six months. Which, you know, in the solar space, guys, a Golden Door Award is a megawatt. Well, he did it in a half of a year. There were only four people in the entire industry last year that earned a Golden Door Award. You know what I mean? To put things into perspective. So if you're listening to this, like the guy knows how to sell. Um, but I get a question and, and I'm not trying to like, I don't, I'm trying to, don't take offense. I, I'm sure you've had this question. Got, you, you know, you're knocking New Jersey. What ethnicity are you? Oh, great question. Oh, great question. Puerto, Rican, Puerto Rican, Filipino. Filipino. Puerto Rican, Filipino. Yeah. You know how many times people are like, well, I can't sell because I'm not some pretty white guy. <laughs> I mean, you're a pretty Puerto Rican, I guess. <laughs> I mean, but do you, do you ever get that? I mean, you're some fit, dark, handsome guy, but it's like, you know how many times people come to me and they're like, well, I just can't really knock these neighborhoods or, you know, like people don't trust me. Have you, I mean, if you think it's like you're one of the best out there. So I'm going to make this, I'm going to make this known just so that anybody that's dealing with this mentality of like, I'm the victim here, they can overcome that because obviously you do something. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's. A, I'm so glad you brought that up. And to be transparent with you, Sam, a lot of leaders will not ask that question solely because let's not say it's the elephant in the room, but it's just weird to ask. So I actually, uh, thanks for asking that. You know, and I'll tell you this: Do I have the mindset when I go out there that I, I'm, I may not be the same color as a majority of the demographics out there, or they're going to look at me differently? Hell no, absolutely not. I have a voice just like anyone else does. I feel that if I go, I lead with my personality, my smile. What does it matter what I look like, uh, who I am, how tall or how short I am, how in shape or how out of shape I am? Uh, so most importantly, I find that, um, you know, leading this company, uh, I am one of the, uh, let's say, most ethnic people at the top of the company. Uh, I find that a way to motivate some of, the, some of those that are coming into the company. You know, you'll find that a lot of guys say, well, it's hard to go sell in a, a, a rich, uh, affluent uh, white neighborhood. Bull, bull crap. That has nothing to do with your ethnicity. Uh, it has 100% to do with your presentation, your personality, and uh, uh, you know, overall the way you present yourself, how you speak, how you articulate your words. Um, so thanks for asking that. Hell no, absolutely not. Love it, love it. No, and, and I just needed to. Like for me, I just feel like there's there's so many people out there that are like, you know, I'll never be great. And I'm just like, dude, the guy makes millions of dollars knocking doors. Like, come on. Like, it's like you can do like, of course. Anyway, so yeah, I'm like, anyway, so let's kind of, so leadership you've dealt, you kind of modge podge this old school. So Trinity has kind of an interesting background. Sure. So, mm -hmm. you know, this whole Josh Williams kind of merged with Trinity and this whole like we're disrupting this previous culture and kind of this different dynamics of leadership. Talk to me a little bit about how that kind of went down and then kind of maybe some of the, the struggles and the, the wins of having some really dynamic backgrounds in this yeah. structure. That, that's a really good question. So, Sam, we find that, uh, let's say in our industry, right? let's say you go to an alarm company, typically all the leaders from that company, they came from the alarm sector. Let's say you go into roofing. They're typically all from a roofing background of some sort. Pest control, same exact. Yep. Um, where I find that solar is actually a little bit different. So let's take away the Trinity part and I'll get into that, get into that in a second. But yeah. let's just talk about solar because solar is a, 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 let's say, newer uh, to, to the door-to-door -door sector. Whereas you're going to have guys that come from pests, from alarms, um, from cable, yep. uh, from roofing, really <laughs> all over but what i found here at, what i found here you know at the company that i work with i work for a ceo who's been in the traditional right salesmanship for the past 24 years so he started out as a heating and air company ended up doing solar in 04 and the man's never knocked on a door nor has he seen a door team perform so to come into this company and show him that hey this door to door this door to door uh, presence that we can bring can truly revamp your company not only um you know, with integrity, but also with explosive growth in the markets that you want. So every conversation that I have, uh, you know, with my CEO, it's, it's, uh, let's say it's, it's, it's almost mind blowing, right? He says, people will move to New Jersey to come knock doors. I say, Tommy, let me just show you. So we literally get guys just as you do to move across country to come see this solar opportunity. But what I find is regardless of what leaders come from what industry, these guys have great knowledge to bring to the table. And as long as they can lead with, let's say, lead with an open mind, have a curious mindset, ultimately get the buy-in um, of the individuals, it, ha it has no relevance of what industry you came from. Because again, as we said, it's about the personality that you bring to the table, right? Do you have the right perspective on what it takes to get a sale to the roof or do you get a sale completed? Forget about to the roof. Can you go from, from, from point of contact to point of sale? And for me, it doesn't matter what industry you come from. Um, and I think the overlapping, um, let's say, common common thing that you would need is is leadership. Yeah. I don't think that it doesn't matter, uh, you know, how you're going to get into a door or whatnot. Do you have the leadership that can collaborate all the ideas together to get the put the best idea forward? So, what's your? I guess if you had to give like your top three principles of leadership that you found, kind of, you know, mod podging all these different backgrounds, different people. If you had to give like three simple nuggets, what would they be? Like my top three principles. Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good question. Uh, I'd probably say number one is buy-in. You have to be able to influence people and buy-in that comes into many different categories of what I'm speaking on there, but you have to get the buy-in from your people, right? Inclusive of the guy that's sitting next to you and the guy that's above you. Next, you have to have prudence. You have to, you have to have the ability to make the right decision. I find that, you know, if you come from a different industry, you may be jaded in which way you're gonna, your decision process can be. If you can't come and 
level the playing field and say, hey, this is the right decision, regardless of who it came from, um, you, you're, you're in the wrong place, right? And number mm. probably the last one is perspective, right? You have to be able to put yourself in the other person's shoes to find out why are they bringing this idea to the table? And is this truly going to be what's best for the company? Yeah. So how is it hard sometimes to get the right perspective? Because I feel, do you feel like your perspective is challenged quite a bit as a leader? Always. I, I think we can, we can both agree to that. Your perspective is always going to be a challenge solely because they're going to say uh, a couple of things, right? Well, Christian, you're young. Well, Christian, you come from the alarm ministry. You don't, you just don't get it. And my job is not to convince you to under, to, to agree with my idea. My job is to get you to understand my perspective. I'm just asking mm-hmm. you to put yourself in my shoes and see it the way our people will see it. You know, uh, Sam, you'll, you'll, you can identify me as a player's coach. My job is to get out there, identify some of the pain points in the field and ultimately create solutions to get more deals to the roof. So for me, do I find it difficult? It's always going to be difficult. Right? That's our job. Our job as leaders is to be able to show that perspective the right way and to get people to, to see to see what we're saying, not, not hear what we're saying. Yeah. No, and I think here's what's interesting, too. Because I, I want you to think back to like maybe moments as a leader. And, you know, I think a lot of times we get put into leadership positions and we're learning as well. You know, um, is there any times that in your career as like a leader and your growth that you've kind of had to almost like you messed up, like your perspective was completely skewed and you had to kind of like, oh, shiz, like you were right, guys. I was an idiot. And like, I don't know, like, do you think of any crossroads or, or, or loses in your leadership you know, career that's kind of stood out to you? Um, could I think of some? How about, can I think of many? Uh, okay. <laughs> Sam, there's going to be many mistakes that, that we make solely because, again, that's all we know. We'll come to the table and say, well, I know what's best, so we need to go with this. Um, and a perfect example is when we actually started our lead generation team almost two years ago. My CEO brought this idea and he said, hey, direct sales is awesome. How do we get a direct sales team to branch off and go do lead generation? And I, I, I laughed. I was like, yeah, right. Our guys can go out. They can knock their own. They can close their own. What do we need setters for? I'm not doing that. So I literally go down to the office that I was going to see that day. And I said, hey, guys, uh, I, I, I pitch on direct. And I pitch how great everyone's doing with closing their own deals. And I said, hey, guys, who wants to go out there and open leads for everybody? I said, that's what I thought. And I moved on. I didn't even pitch the idea. I'll tell you this. A couple of weeks later, I sit back in front of my CEO Ask me, Christian, I really need you to go get this done. This is, a, this is a great business model for our business. I know you can go through with it. He said, I need you to do this for me. I go back, I re-pitch it. Our lead generation currently is the number one form of the, our leads into the company that our, our closers can go close these deals. So literally drove lead acquisition costs down, has made our business much more sustainable and allowed us to introduce others into the solar sector without uh, dealing with the long install times or whatnot. So literally change the landscape of our business and that's something that I did not see his perspective at first. And I messed up. Yeah, that's a that's a really good example. Um, and this is it. Kind of segues us into like one of these topics I want to talk on because you know roofers and I mean even alarm guys and solar space especially. There's this whole setter closer debate. Like, do I go hire some setters? How do I hire some setters? Do I get closers only? Is it is it like, what are the pain points? What are the structures? I mean, that that kind of leads us into this. So, I, you know, I am going to be ended. I did the setter program for an, a year and a half, and I got to a point yeah. where I was like, "F this," and I shut up. I shut it down. I just said, "Either you're a setter and you figure out how to close, or you're a closer and you figure out how to get off the couch." And uh, let's uh, let's make a company where guys go eat what they kill. You know what I mean? I'm sick of like. You know what I mean? And, and, and I want to talk to this. This is, this is the part where I'm like, how do you, like, this, this is the question. I'm running a solar company and I've got a bunch of closers and all of a sudden my sets dip a little bit. Well, what do my closers do? They sit on the freaking couch. It's like, how do you motivate the closer when he doesn't have a damn appointment to go knock once he's been spoon fed for the last two weeks? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's my question. I want to solve this problem and it sounds like you probably dealt with it. So I want to know, what do you do? Well, well the question is, Sam, is, is your lead generation program, is that sustainable in the first place? Right. And I think that's something that we, that we battled in our initial, our initial months, our initial year with introducing lead generation is because as you know, you recruit an entire team over, they come on, they perform, they see the next best thing, they leave. 
right? So how do we create a proprietary model whereas our lead generators feel comfortable, they understand the growth, and ultimately creates a sustainable lead flow for our closers? Now here's mm. this. And on top of that, it's about setting the proper expectations. You know, Sam, if I recruit you today and I say, Sam, I'm going to give you 20 appointments every single month, no matter what, even if there's a storm outside. Uh, that's just not realistic. Yeah. Our goal is to be able to provide a baseline of leads for you. Let's say if we're going to promise you 15 leads, 15 leads a month, knowing that we have the ability to provide 30 to 40 leads per month for that person. Right. So setting mm. a proper expectation by saying, hey, in the down months, we're looking for you to not only go self-gen, but go increase your referrals. So what we did was we created a program to incentivize our closers to capitalize on referrals. Whereas we don't mind paying the customer out of the company's pocket for a larger referral, which incentivizes our guys to say, hey, not only are we going to get a higher commission when we go generate our own deals, but we, our company has also supported us in the referrals. So I think from your perspective, Sam, where you're just creating the lead gen, uh, that's a fantastic first step. But we have to make sure all of the other channels are in line with the proper expectations on what we're expecting from our lead generation program. Mm. You know, they're they're not our like they're not they're not our bread and butter. They're our bread. We still have butter. So ooh, good yeah. line. So let me let me ask you: this. You recruit a setter or a lead gen guy. What's the expectation you set for him? Yeah, again, a really good question. So let's let's back this up. What am I looking for for a lead setter, and what am I looking for yeah. for a direct guy? Because there's there's two different, and I would classify direct as a guy who can knock on his own and close his own. So just so just for a quick, yeah. lead setter, all he's doing, all he or she is doing, is setting the lead and passing it off, right? So we're yeah. looking for, we're looking for a couple things. Um, if you're entry level, if you don't have sales experience whatsoever, um, let's bring you in. Let's teach you up on this. We meet every single day. We have a very unique training program where we're not looking for our sales reps to go out to the individual offices and train. We centralize it. Every single one of our lead generators comes into corporate for a full day and we provide them with a very uh, symmetrical training throughout the entire company. Right now, so even if you recruited a guy in Massachusetts, you're going to bring him into New Jersey, even yep. if he's just a lead setter. It's worth your time and money. He has no experience, no chance of, no proof that it'll actually work out. You're still going to say, come to New Jersey. 100%. Get your butt down here. We want to make sure, number one, Sam, that you're bought into us. You have to see who we are. Hmm. Right. So, not only setting the proper expectations, but we have to sell our brand, we have to sell our people, and we have to sell our company. Right. Because as you know, indoors, it's going to be difficult out there. There's going to be days that you don't get deals. So what we found was it was difficult to bring guys into the in, in from any industry and get them into solar. So for our lead gen, we really set the expectation around that. Hey, you're going to be able to go out. You're going to be able to have a quick conversation. And what we call it, <laughs> a demo can sit that day. So it's very similar to an alarm, but you're not stepping one foot inside of the house. You're knocking on the door. You're getting them interested. If that appointment sits, you're being compensated from our company, which is pretty awesome. So the expectation is this isn't a four-month summer where you're going to go make 100 grand. We're going to give you a great income, whereas you can go out and make anywhere, let's say, between 30 and 75 grand over the year just going and knocking on doors. Right. The expectation for us is to be able to make, let's say, two warm transfers a day. All you have to do is knock on the door and get someone to agree to take the appointment. Again, not selling anything, just take the appointment to talk to someone else to be educated on solar. So that's the expectation. Very, very minimal. I'm not looking for the guy to come out and you know, set 50 leads in a day. It's just not realistic. We're looking for a sustainable way, whereas we can recruit locally, not go out to California or Arizona or wherever it may be. Look, we're in New Jersey. Right. I want to give our home people some jobs um, and not not complicated um, as much as the direct sales process where not only do they have to learn how to knock, they have to learn how to get inside the home. You have to learn how to close and then you have to learn how to retain. That's a lot for one person to learn. So let's it is. let's simplify this. Let's give you a sustainable cash flow and let's teach you the entry part of our business to be able to get you to go be your own closer. So is that, is that the, the path? Like when you sit down with a guy, is the path like we're going to graduate you at one point or another into a, your own closing ability? Or is it kind of like we're recruiting you to be in a, a setter 
forever. I mean, is, is there like a clear path that you give him or is it like, or is it like in a month or in six months, you're going to then transition or like, yeah, kind of what's that path to become a closer look like? Yeah. So that's a good question because you could say, well, Christian, you have your lead setters, you have your direct guys, obviously someone's making more money. How do you protect that? Um, but yeah. ultimately, look, we're, we're going to back into what their, what their goals are, right? Are you looking to go, go be a, let's say a couple hundred thousand dollar type guy? Are you just looking for a sustainable income due to your current lifestyle? You know, you may have someone that just provides family to their, I'm sorry, provides money to their family on a consistent basis where they don't have the ability to go out and learn for four months to go knock doors or go learn for two months without a sale. It's just not going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. so when you go there, it is a natural progression to bring someone into our lead generation program and then get them off to direct. And then eventually, let's say, into our sole closer program. Um, but again, sustainability, whereas they have a consistent income with what they're doing. So they're not, we're not paying them too less that they don't want to stay there. And we're not paying them too much that they do want to stay there. We're giving them a very fair income, whereas they can stay in lead generation, right, for the consistent cash flow, not dealing with the long insult, insult times, all the paperwork. Um, to, and you know this, Sam, it's, it's, it can be a mess when you're in direct sales, right? You are your, you are your own manager. Um, so again, we have, some, we have some of our reps who have been in, uh, let's say, our outreach, we call it outreach, for three years now. And they love it. But what we also do is we give them a path to management, whereas our district managers from, from 15 of our outreach offices, um, they're only required to knock on certain days, right? So there's a progression to get into management. There's a progression to get into direct so sales. district manager over an outreach team. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So they don't really, like, keep going. Sorry. I just want to clarify what that meant. Yeah, no, yeah. no worries at all. So again, so let's say you come in as a rep. Uh, what's the progression? Well, you can come in, you have a couple options. You can either make a very healthy career, making a very fair income, let's say 50 to 60 grand a year, knocking doors for a living, right? You love knocking doors. You don't want to get inside of the home. Uh, you don't want to carry your, your, your uh, deal from yesterday onto next week. You're done with that customer, right? Yeah. You have, you have the guy that wants to grow into management. So we've built up every single one of our lead generation offices has their own district manager and assistant district manager, whereas there's two. Okay. Small and they run meetings every day. They run meetings every single day. Okay. Which is, which is so great. what time do they meet? I'm curious, what time do they meet? Yeah, definitely. They meet at 10 o'clock every single day. So this morning I got, uh, right now it's 1032. Um, I watched the team walk into one of the back offices this morning at nine. So at not, on Saturdays they start at nine uh, and our call center closes at four. So again. Uh, so nine to four, yep. basically. Yep. And do, what time do they go every day? So they're meeting every day at 10 other than Saturday mm -hmm. and they meet at nine on Saturday and then what time do you expect them to knock to and how do you hold them accountable to that? Yeah, good question. So the call center closes at eight. So we're not taking out, and it's seasonal, right? In the summer, we'll go till nine, but right now it's currently eight. So we're only asking them uh, to work, let's say from 12 to eight. Very simple. What we've also done is we've created, a, again, a very sustainable pay model for the outreach reps, whereas we pay them a base salary, Sam. You know, it's, okay. it's obviously production based. So if you don't hit your production, it actually comes out to be the exact same thing as a commission pay scale. Um, because if you don't hit the minimum expectations, well, we, we can't keep you as an employee. Very simple. Okay. Right? So kind of the same obstacle that you came with. Hey, either you learn or, or, or you got to get out. I, I can't can't keep you around, uh, you know, potentially uh, habituating certain areas um, if it's not going to be beneficial to you and us at the same time. So same thing that we create. Yeah, of course. Is the quota based on sets or based on shown appointment? Shown appointments. Shown appointments. Okay. Yep. So we. Um, go ahead. No. So, and then do you expect them to get utility bill with that or do you find that that's not super necessary? Okay. Nothing at all other than basic qualifications. Do you have a 650 credit score? Um, when we call into the call center, all call center is scrubbing every single lead that comes in. Um, so as soon as they call in, all the computers are popped up. We're looking at the site. And then at that point, we're placing it on a salesman's calendar to go run that appointment. We also so the setter, so he knocks and he's like, I'm going to get you on with my call center real quick. Confirm the appointment. Yeah. And then yeah. they kind of confirm and schedule it with the closer right there. Absolutely. Cool. Um, okay. So that helps me understand the whole setter outreach. Now it's like, help me understand this whole closer. You said there's this outreach program, then you have this uh, direct <laughs> direct program, and then you have the sole closer program, which are just the closer. So direct, this is where I feel like there's like this mental barrier. It's like if I have, uh, if I have 
guys that are like getting a couple leads a week. Cause like, you know, you said, you're like, I might be able to provide you 15 leads a month or so. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, that's not a, that's not three a day. You know what I mean? So this guy that's in direct, he's getting a couple a week. It sounds like, right. Uh, a guy that's in direct, uh, they're getting nothing. They're going oh, out. They're not even getting anything. Oh, okay. So all these setters aren't setting anything for direct. Uh, no, we have what's called a solar pro, which is more on the traditional side. Let's say an experienced guy who's just a high volume guy that we know if we can provide a couple appointments with, uh, you can increase your sales, but ultimately direct is just door knockers who close their own deals. Okay. So let's talk about those guys. How often do they meet? Uh, they meet twice a week. So every Tuesday and Friday, uh, typically a two hour meeting. And then for rookies, we bring them in one hour early to instruct them on some of the things they need to know. And so they're just your traditional solar gig, like every I mean, set, close, everything. Yep. Now, let me ask you this. Yep. At what point do they say, how come I'm not getting sets? What do you have? What do you, what do you say to that? Like, what, yeah. like, I'm sure that those conversations come up. Why? I, I should be a solar closer. I should only, I should be getting all the appointments. I'm a bad A. Like, why don't I get the sets? Like, I'm sure you've had that guy. Is, is this Dave Rappu? <laughs> Sam, are you my rep right now? <laughs> I, come on. I, no, I actually, dude, it's funny. Anybody that's worked for me and you guys can validate this. I didn't take sets. Like mm. I was like, screw these sets. I was boring. Like I was like, why am I driving around the freaking state trying to get appointments when I can go knock a door next door and it takes me two seconds to get an appointment. <laughs> like, you know what's you know what so funny? I'm the same way. I, I like to increase my opportunities. I like to put my, my fate in my own hands. Um, I've never taken a lead either. So it's pretty different that we've created this program. But of course, that's the organic question. Everyone says, uh, why can't I get leads? So here's this. Uh, we create the pay so it's very even uh, to incentivize the right behaviors. Right? So our direct guys, they're going to make more per kilowatt. Um, our traditional guys, one, we're going to charge them a lead fee. And on top of that, you're going to make less per kilowatt. It's just, it's just as simple as that. You're going to get leads. We have to cover the cost of our lead generators. Um, and it's a different expectation in regards to leadership. We pay our direct managers a little bit different than we do our traditional team. Because again, the traditional team, they're going out there. They're creating their own deals. Um, it's a little bit longer of a process because they don't have as much back-end support. Whereas our direct, we have an entire room in the back who creates their own contracts and kicks it back to the reps. So all they have to do is knock the door, get the bill, right? Sign a letter of intent. Our internal team will create the contract and kick it back to them. So the, the appropriate answer is we incentivize the pay the right way to reduce those questions. Now let's, okay. let's say a guy says, hey, well, I want to go into traditional, which just is our, which just is our closer. Well, fantastic. Yeah. We'll put you with the leaders of those divisions. You'll interview with those teams. If you have the sales qualifications and the certifications to be able to understand how to navigate a deal, um, because again, you're creating it on your own. You're designing your own system. You're using multiple different finance partners. Let's say Mosaic, Sunlight, Dividend. You have to understand the knowledge of the solar landscape. Uh, so if you don't have the aptitude, mm. if you don't have the aptitude to get in that division, and that's not calling someone stupid, not at all. But if you don't, if you're not tech savvy, if you don't understand the numbers, well, that's not the best division for you. If you're not mm. the most organized, if you're not the most structured, stay in direct. We're going to give you everything that you need there, really. So, so Sam, to, to, to make this a broader scope, we're looking at what division people should go into. We're looking at three main things, attitude, aptitude, and work ethic, right? They, and they yep. all three are totally different. So again, we set the proper expectations with our sales teams to make sure they understand why or why they're not, why or why, why aren't they in those cer- uh, certain divisions and draw the line very firm in the sand. But if I, I were think- to go ahead. Yeah, no, no, keep going. I have, an, I have two good questions. Keep okay. going. If I were to say that we didn't have those issues as we continue to grow, um, I'd be lying to you. We absolutely have those things where a guy says, well, I want to be that guy. Well, we tell them, hey, you're trading in your, your direct culture, the knocking, the, the grittiness, the, the aggressive for a traditional slower pace type sale, whereas that may be more sustainable for your lifestyle. So again, each channel has their perks. Um, I'm a direct guy. I, I, I love knocking. I love getting out there. I love the hype. Uh, my boy, yeah, man, my voice is a little bit raspy because I had a meeting yesterday and I'm a, I'm a goer, man. I'm very similar to yourself. I'm full of energy and, uh, yeah, dude, that, that's, that's just me. So I'm with you on that. So let me ask you this. How much interaction do the three parties have? Does that make sense? Like, do they have combined meetings? Do they interact with each other or is it kind of like, 
I don't even know who's on the outreach team. I'm on direct. I couldn't even tell you. I don't even know who the solar clothes are because I'm in direct. Like, is it very separated or is it very like, yeah, we all meet together and chat or I guess what's the interaction there? Yeah, Sam, that's a yeah, Sam, that's that's question. When we first started this, they were all combined meetings. Uh, and we found that the managers weren't providing relevant content to each division. As of late, mm-hmm. we separated the channels, right? Whereas outreach, direct, and traditional all meet on different days. Now, what happens is once a month, we all get together. Like yesterday, we had a combined meeting with our outreach, direct, and traditional divisions. And it's not teaching on trainings. We're not instructing on how to get a deal to the roof. We're solely instructing on culture. We're making sure the hype in the office is the right, the right thing. We're making sure the, 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 the pulse is healthy. So again, mm. no training whatsoever. When we get all teams together, it's really for culture, hype, um, you know, really lighting the vision of the entire company, not specifically on each division. I like that. I like that. Um, because I think, I think what happens, like you just said, is it's like, there's such different programs. And if you try to meet together, it's people aren't getting the value that they need to. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so each has its own manager, assistant manager type structures. Okay. Uh, what about competitions? So, Cause there's such different metrics. How do you do like company wide competitions and things like that? Because, you know, one's getting just a freaking bit like appointment. One's getting their own closes. So they're grittier. And another one's getting spoon fed. Like, is there, is there some difficulty or some best practices when you're trying to create a competition and track numbers and stuff like that? Absolutely. Just like anything, it was, it was, it was a trial and error. Whereas we would try to do a competition that was very, uh, you know, very symmetrical between all divisions. We found that, hey, it's just not possible. So the prizes, the trips, everything's the same. But we've backed into what metrics are equivalent to a sale, right? So if, mm-hmm. I, were to, if I were to ask you the question, Sam, how many alarms would you say could account for one solar sale? Probably three, four. Yeah, I would say three to one. So we're very symmetrical on that. Whereas we say that almost very similar to our outreach and sales team, right? We say we have a Dominican Republic trip coming up. So we say in Q4, you have to have 80 demos. That means 80 sits to qualify. But sales, you only need 30 sales. So Mm. you you can see the ratios. Whereas the prizes are identical, but the metrics to get to those are vastly different. Now, to answer your second question, how do our direct guys and our traditional guys um, how guys and gals, how do they compete in competitions? Again, very different metrics. Whereas you can get a point for just generating an account. Whereas traditional, yeah. you only get a point for closing the account. But on direct, makes- you, have, you have the opportunity to close and you have to <laughs> self-gen it. But remember, traditional guys, remember we asked them for referrals and a self-gen. So they have the same opportunity to get the amount of points, but direct has the strength in going to self-gen their own. So organically, a direct guy will typically win the competitions uh, unless a traditional guy says, Hey, I'm going to go self gen some and they can, they can go compete for the top spots. I love that. I love that. So let's kind of dive into, I mean, I don't want to dive into this a ton, but because obviously this is what you're training on at at door to door con, but it's like year in and year out, you know, you're kind of getting monotonous. It's the same job. It's a year round program. Have you found any best practices as far as systems and structures to keep your guys motivated, you know, through trial and error that you're like, okay, this is a year round thing. This is a job. It's not a sprint, but like we all got to get in hustle. Cause I feel like one of my biggest struggles, you know, I go and consult a lot of these companies. It's like, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you one, this is great. I trained on this thing, the power hour and uh, this company's like, you know, Hey, in the morning, you know, I was like, Hey, in the morning, you gotta have your power hour, et cetera. Well, they misinterpreted it. They call me and they're like, dude, this is like three weeks after I met with them. We did it. We implemented your power hour and our sales have tripled. And I was like, what? And I was like, that's like not a really interesting correlation. You know what I mean? I was like, how does that even correlate? Okay. And they're like, yeah, we got all of our guys to go knock at least one hour a day. (laughs) And I was like, whoa, like you tripled because you got your guys to go for an hour. What if you guys were actually committed to going out for the whole day? Yeah. So, I, you know what I mean? I was like, holy cow. And I was like, that's no, this is called the power nine hour. Like that's, <laughs> that's work. Like anyway, so I feel like in solar, it's really hard sometimes because everybody's so independent. Have you found a way to hold their accountability to like just working the hours? Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, well, it's hard, Sam, because if, if you say, if you're expecting every single employee you have to have that mindset of, Hey, I can do this all the time. Um, it's just not common, especially when, if you come from the, from the door to door industry, you're, you're, you're used to working. Um, sorry, if I'm drinking. You're used to working spurts. Um, whereas here you're working year round. So really our yeah. people, uh, having a career, right? How do you, how do you work here for 10 years? Right? I'm really not interested in if you, in you, if you want to come out and try me out for mm-hmm. the summer. I want you to work here and I want you to develop a lifestyle that you can sustain your family year after year after year. I don't want you to have to be submitting resumes next year or going to interview with a different company and Sam, mm-hmm. I think, oh, we're a W2 company. So we, we give that, we give the value to our employees of, uh, you know, uh, medical, dental, vision, 401k, life insurance. Um, so for the companies that are listening out there, it's the offering that you have to your employees, not just the pay scale or the product that you're working on. How do you invest in their lives for the long term? And that's something that we'll speak on every single, you know, every, not every meeting, but every big meeting that we'll have um, is that there's been a guy here for 10 years. There's been a guy here for 15 years, been a guy here for 20 years. Uh, and really it's, it's our consistency in delivering for our employees on a consistent basis. That's why mm. I love competitions. I love incentives. Um, but again, I'll bring it up again. The carrots and sticks don't always work. What can they rely on every single day that they come to work? And that's something that we want to do. We, we have to be sustainable for them. We have to be, in essence, predictable for them. Uh, they shouldn't come to work saying, well, what's next? No, no, no. I love that. I love that because I think a lot of times we're in, like, it's almost like we're enrolling them that they do this job to win a competition. They're not doing this job to take pride in the job and career that they chose. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? It's like almost like a higher cause. It's like, look, I'm doing this job. Like, If I didn't show up to my work today, like whether I'm a janitor or a plumber, whatever, and I came home and my wife was like, hey, how'd work go today? And I like looked her in the eye and I go, oh, I just haven't been going. It's like, you know what I mean? Like, like, like fathom that. And it's so funny, like the way that you just put that, it's like, wait a minute. It'd be like telling my wife, it's like, I have a job. I'm the meat, I'm the, I'm the breadwinner here. I provide it. And I'm going to look you in the eye and be like, yeah, I just don't go. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. I, I say a very similar example. I say, you don't, do you really think the garbage man goes home to, goes home to his family and says, Oh, it smells like trash every day. No, they're used to it. That's what they signed up for. This is, this is the sector that they're in. They're not looking for, Oh, I hope next week I'll go pick up some flowers. No, you're yeah. going to pick up garbage every single day. That's what you do. So to be transparent with you, I don't even believe in the word burnout. We pay, yeah. we pay you to do this job. Not, you're not doing it for free right so we want to hit there <laughs> nugget nugget you know what i mean like it's like we you get compensated it's a career it's a job it's something that you need to take pride in and take serious because i just think like i don't know i, I think maybe we do incentivize the sticks and you know carrots too much like i think it you're right i mean and and i get it it's fun it makes it a game but i think a lot of times People don't ever really accept or embrace the job. Like this is a job. If you had a normal job, you'd work eight hours a day. You better be on the freaking doors for that amount. Of, you know what I mean? Or doing your job that much time. Um, and 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 you're right. I think burnout is such a such an overused term, which is just what it's a facade. It's just it's fake. It's like what is burnout? It's like it's it's just it's it's just it's just an excuse. And you know what I found is. Uh, every excuse, it, it, it's an excuse. That's why it's called an excuse. It makes sense to you. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? If you, can, if you can separate the emotion from, okay, man, this is door to door. Or how about this is, I'm going to be here for a very long time and I'm going to be able to provide consistently for my family. And that's something yep. that I would encourage all the companies out there who have door to door. Stop pitching on the short term success. Pitch on the long game. Let these yep. guys and gals understand that they have value in your company and they can stay with you for as long as they want to be there right? Provide them that consistency and that sustainability so they can feel safe in their job. That's a big, that's an important thing that we, uh, I think we miss on Sam, you know, a person should feel safe in their career. I shouldn't feel like, oh man, if I have to go to this market next year, it's going to be tough. No, put some roots down, right? Have, have some consistency in your life, have the discipline to go to your job every single day, go deliver. And you'll be at your, you'll be at that company for as long as you want to be there. I love that. I love that. Um, okay. So we got to kind of wrap out, wrap up. Do you have any, I mean, dude, honestly, like I've just appreciated your time. Like this has just been, I'm I, like, this is just a conversation. Like the, why I love these podcasts is it's like, we're just jamming. Like if we were just like 
going to lunch and it's like, tell me all your, tell me all your love and nuggets and just about you. This is cool. So one last question I always ask people and honestly make out, make sure that you guys go to Christian's workshop. He's going to be probably one of the crowd favorites. Um, those that don't know him, obviously it's like, this is such an interesting event because if people understood the talent, the, the know-how, the, the expertise that's coming to door to door con, I think people would pay five grand for a freaking ticket. Like people that are paying 150, 100, 200 bucks for a ticket right now. I'm literally saying like, you literally, you have a profession where you can go rub shoulders with guys like Christian and you get to go pick their brain. I mean, Christian, you get to go to the VIP dinner. I know probably Chris and those guys yeah. talked about it last year. So you get a free ticket to the VIP dinner. Um, and, you know, I think like being able to hang out with guys like this, it, it, you know, we've all heard it. You surround yourself with the best, you become the best. And it's like, I, I, I think people, um, that don't go to your workshop that are in the roofing or solar people that are trying to run these, you know, and motivate and be better leaders. They're, they're crazy. So, uh, but my last, my last question that I have for you would be um, if you could give the door to door industry, one piece of advice, what would it be? Goodness, man. I'm going to read a quote. And this would be for leaders. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them task and work but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. Mm, say that one more time. Yeah, one more time. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them task and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. Wow. Meaningful. Yeah, man. Because, so I guess why, 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 why that quote? Expound on that. I mean, that was, I mean, you could just mic drop and walk away. But like, I mean, I mean, I don't want to like leave everybody just like, what? Yeah, that's what? okay. No problem. Right. It's, 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 it's not about the little things that we can accomplish, right? We look for those in our daily wins to get through our day, but play the long game. Again, as I said it, we, we look at this in such short sprints. If you look at this in the long game, you ride the middle wave and you look at this as a career versus just a job, this becomes a lot more, a lot more satisfactory to your own, your own being. It feels good on you. So right at the end, it says, mm. rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. That means it's not going to be easy, right? It's not going to be, it's going to be freaking hard and it's going to be long. I'm not looking for you to go knock one door today and come back and so I can reward you. I'm looking for you to develop into a human being that I can have w I can have in my company for the long haul, right? And I believe that's all. That's how all of our leaders treat our people here, such as my co, uh, senior vice president Chris Gallagher, and all of our guys in here. We're teaching these guys life 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 skills that whether they're here at our company forever, they're going to go make another company a damn good company because we've taught them great qualities for sustainability. Right for the long haul. Play the long game, man. Play the long game. Love it. Well, dude, thanks so much for your time, and it's been fun jamming this morning. And uh, yeah, we'll see it. We'll see you in January, brother. Brad, thanks, you, Sam. Have a good day. Yeah, we'll see you.